thank you everyone for joining. Um, you have joined the seed processing and storage uh, virtual training uh, with Cheryl Berker, who is the seed conservation program manager at the California Botanic Garden, and um, myself, Naomi Fraga. I'm the director of conservation programs at the California Botanic Garden, and we're really happy to be with you today. Um, so Cheryl, if you can move to the next slide. So just a few logistics before we get started. Uh, this presentation will be recorded and it'll be uploaded to YouTube. Um, I believe um, it should be uploaded around next week. So stay tuned for a link and um, we'll definitely send that out. Um, for questions during the webinar, we're going to hold Q&A at the end of this webinar. And so please place your questions in the Q&A as we go along, and then I'll be fielding those questions. Um, you'll probably primarily have questions for Cheryl because she has the real meat of the presentation. Um, and then I want to thank the National Park Service for supporting this webinar and helping to get the message out. Um, thank, and I'm really glad to see everyone here. And especially I want to thank to thanks, send thanks to Steve, um, who has given us great assistance in this. Um, and this is the first of a series of trainings we're going to be doing. Um, and so right on this particular training, we're focusing on seed processing and storage primarily because of the season that we're in right now, uh, being the late summer months. Uh, this is the time to be thinking about getting your seeds ready for processing and putting them into storage until you're ready to use them. So we'll be focusing on these topics today, but we will be covering other topics in the future, including uh, seed collecting and um, other aspects of seed work um, with emphasis on uh, the California flora. So stay tuned for future trainings. Um, so next slide. Uh, so these are the basic topics we're going to be covering today. We're going to provide an overview introduction to seed conservation and its importance. And then we'll launch into all these aspects of um, seed post seed collection care, including a seed drying, processing, storage, and an introduction to viability testing. Next. All right. So we'll dive into the importance of seed conservation and give you an intro. So we can't start any presentation um, about seeds, seed saving, uh, native plants, anything like that without talking about how important uh, native plants are to all life on earth. Um, they support us in our, I, I know I'm probably preaching to the fire, but they sustain us in our daily lives and clearly provide habitat for wildlife, support rare species and pollinators and um, provide really important um, ecosystem function. And um, especially in these changing times, um, carbon sequestration is really essential. So plants are um, the all, in my mind, they're the all-stars of the universe. Uh, next slide. And so in order to support plant diversity and ecosystems worldwide, um, we really have a need to develop a seed supply of native plants, um, especially with increasing disturbance. Um, we have increasing anthropogenic disturbance that has led to land use change, um, and we have increasing invasions of exotic species. And so in order to sort of deal with these issues, we really need native seed to enhance and restore our ecosystems. Um, and we also are seeing um, climate disruptions. Um, we've just in California have experienced a historic drought, a drought that hasn't been seen anything like that in, in thousands of years. Um, so that um, clearly has had a large impact on um, whole habitats um, and vegetation types. And um, of course, we're experiencing also our altered fire regimes. Um, here you can see a photo from the Erskine fire, which took place in Kern County in 2016. This is in the Southern Sierra Nevada and it um, spanned um, the forest up high in Sequoia National Forest and came down into desert um, ecosystems. Um, so securing, securing seed is really this first step in nature-based solutions when we're dealing with um, the biodiversity extinction crisis and the climate crisis. And so it's really essential as we move forward um, in these changing times. Next. 
And this is just all a part of, I feel like, our duty to be good stewards and care for the, the land. Um, this is essential work for care and management of ecosystems. So it's not really optional to just kind of let things, you know, um, I guess degrade and um, be left untended. And so this is, I think, um, really, um, we need to advance this work as we restore our relationship with the land and these reciprocal contributions and our connections between people and nature. I think it's a very essential part of that. Cheryl, next. And this work is not without tremendous challenges. Seed-based restoration, native acquiring native seed for restoration is very challenging, and especially uh, in light of climate change. So seed itself can be a very limited resource. So for instance, prior to this year, so we've had a tremendous amount of precipitation in California um, in the winter of 2022 to 2023, and that has been a real boon for us. It's been um, a real opportunity to acquire seeds. So anyone who is joining this uh, training who got to be on a seed collection team this year, um, and you had the opportunity to you know, really um, probably collect a lot of seed. <laughs> um, the three years prior to that were really challenging and much more difficult because of the extreme drought. Um, I could speak from experience from our team here at the California Botanic Garden. We do a lot of seed collecting in the Mojave Desert and it took all of our energy and time to really find just such few populations we could collect from responsibly. And even the most common species like creosote bush did not produce very much seed. Um, so it is really challenging at certain times. Um, so seed is not only a limited resource, but the, the overall the supply of native seed is just emerging. We're developing this pipeline. And that's part of why we're providing this presentation today because more seed collectors are coming online. We need to um, enhance training and kind of prepare the workforce to really create this native seed um, supply um, to support ecosystems from now and into the future. Next. And so another challenge we have in mind is that a lot of the methods and or techniques that we use um, aren't necessarily ready-made for wild species. Uh, seed conservation, a lot of the work is borrowed, borrowed from agricultural systems. And while agricultural systems have developed um, a lot of great ways to kind of increase yield and, you know, get lots of seed generated um, for, you know, feeding the world and production worldwide, uh, the goals of agriculture and wild seed conservation are very different. So agriculture really looks for homogeneity. It seeks to promote uniformity and consistency for reliability and security, um, whereas in wild populations, we seek to maintain that variation. We want to maintain the variation that is existing in wild populations. And every time we take a step through the seed collection, collection process, through our scouting, our collecting, our processing, our storage, every moment down that line, we have the opportunity to actually lose diversity. And so what we're trying to do is to enhance our methods so we don't lose any of that diversity. We can retain as much as possible because that is the raw ingredients for evolution and to have success into the future, especially in a changing climate. Next. And so this work has many benefits. Um, just the act in seed saving itself has so many benefits. Seeds are really, right, they're like these magical beings. I mean, they're not really magic, but they are these really small sort of packets of life. They can, right, they're gonna, tiniest seed can turn into the biggest plant, um, but they are these genetic, they are individuals. They are individual beings that are genetically diverse and they can, you can fit many of them in a small space. And so it's an important resource as an insurance policy against extinction or loss of diversity in the wild. Um, it can form a very important part of an integrated strategy of conservation um, on-site or in-situ and integrating that with ex-situ or off-site strategies such as um, plant propagation, restoration, seed storage, and all these things we're talking about. So those things should definitely be integrated to enhance what's going on on-site. And then um, it's also an easily accessed 
material for research. So just in the process of acquiring seeds, it can expand our research capabilities for these species. Um, and in the process of collecting seed and working with seed, we actually learn a tremendous amount about these species. Um, you know, we learn about seed predators. Um, we, by collecting the seed, we learn what insects are like eating them. Um, we also learn about life history attributes as we um, go through the, you know, germination to propagation process. We learn about these species. So just all these sort of ancillary benefits that come with seed saving. And so there's sort of different stages along the way when we think about development of the native seed supply. So of course we start with seed collection and we're not really gonna be able to go into that in depth today, but that includes a lot of steps, you know, includes creating target lists, um, planning, scouting sites, um, collecting data, collecting the seeds and processing the data. So there's a lot of steps to that. So there's gonna be a whole separate training devoted to that aspect. We're gonna talk today focusing on seed processing and storage. And this will be all the post-collection care. So how to care for the seeds, clean the seeds, um, and also some you know, info on, on how we can detect the viability. And then of course, once that seed has been acquired and it, depending on if it's a long or short-term storage, then um, we could talk about how those seeds can be used, whether it's directly in restoration or foundation seed for um, potential increase in production. And we're not gonna be able to talk about that today. So we're focusing on number two, seed processing, storage, and testing. And so this work that we're doing, it fits into a whole global effort of work all this work happening across the globe. There's many seed conservation networks and partnerships. And each one of these networks or partnerships might have slightly different goals in terms of how many seeds they're looking to secure for each individual collection, what the scope, what different species they're looking to acquire into their collection, what the use of those seeds are. So they each of these different networks might have slightly different goals. Um, but collectively, we're using all very similar methods, sharing information and contributing to this whole global effort to enhance plant diversity and support it. Uh, the, what we're talking about today fits in probably most strongly with what has been developed with Seeds of Success. Um, so the Bureau of Land Management has done a really tremendous job um, in initiating the development of the native seed supply in the United States. Um, we've worked with the BLM as collectors and um, assisting with research um, in that effort. And it's just um, really provided tremendous resources for us to really kind of then expand that work across many more agencies across the United States. And so that brings us to the California Seed Bank, which is an individual seed bank that is a member of some of those groups I showed on the prior slide um, and, and operates in those networks. Um, it's the largest seed, a seed bank dedicated to California native plants. And I'm going to actually turn it over to Cheryl here, and she could tell you more about the California Seed Bank and our work and how it fits in with what we're talking today about and and she'll um, and move forward with the presentation. So thank you, Naomi. Um, so Cheryl. I'm Cheryl Berker. I'm the seed program manager at California Botanic Gardens. So this is a photo of the seed bank that I manage. Cheryl, I can't hear you. Really? Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, okay, good. I'm Cheryl Berker. I'm the seed program manager at California Botanic Garden. So this is a picture of the seed bank that I manage. Um, we have the goal of seed banking all uh, seed bankable species of California, um, really for long-term conservation um, and also to bank them for research purposes. So um, we want our collections to really serve as a safety net against species extinction in the wild. Um, so we're really prioritizing the rare plants of California, trying to get them banked before something happens to them. So uh, this is a map that shows where a bunch of our collections have been made. 
Um, we're primarily doing long-term storage, but we are also involved in various restoration activities. So we have a restoration department. We do restoration seed banking for ANF, um, Angeles National Forest and various partners. Um, we also, as Naomi mentioned, our, uh, we have a seeds of success collecting team. We have been participating in SOS since 2010. Um, and now we're processing those SOS collections as well. And, uh, and then we also have another um, collaborative seed banking effort in the Los Angeles area that is uh, called Seed LA, where we're trying to increase um, native seed supplies for use in local like urban habitat enhancement projects. Um, so we're sort of building up this, um, we're doing more and more restoration style seed collecting. Um, and that's really what this talk is about today, um, is really more focused on restoration size seed collections. Um, and we are jumping straight into uh, how to handle those seed collections once once you have them, right? So we are not covering seed collection today at all. We are just talking about, okay, you have your collection, now what do you do? And that the, the two main takeaways, the key phrases today are gonna be cool and dry. So if you remember nothing else, remember cool and dry. That's how we keep seeds alive post harvest. So we're gonna talk about, sort of walk through the steps of what to do with your seed collections, starting with bringing them back and drying the seed collections down. So this is a photo of our seed drying room. It is not very high tech, it, you know, not very fancy. We also have uh, growth chambers in this room. We use it for some storage, um, but we come back from the field and dry our seed collections down in this room. We lay them out on tables, um, on newspaper and let them dry all the way down, right? So hopefully, um, you have been making your dry seed collections into paper bags, right? That's the, the proper protocol. They say to collect into paper because paper can breathe. Um, but if you're making large, bulky seed collections and putting them in this paper bag, that still can trap quite a bit of humidity. And so if you just leave them in this bag, they can mold over. And that's really what we're trying to avoid. So drying seed collections is really important for preventing mold growth for preventing seed aging and also to make it easier to process collections. Um, so if you try to process collections before they're fully dry, it's a lot harder. You can really like gunk up all of your equipment. Um, so it's best to dry them down as much as possible before you start processing. Um, so just bring your collections back, spread them out in a thin layer uh, in a cool, dry place for I say seven to 14 days here, but it really is gonna depend on what you're collecting and what region you're collecting in, you know, what the ambient conditions are. Um, but this is what, what we do uh, in Claremont in this seed drying room with our um, largely dry collections that are mostly from the desert. So, um, you know, take that with a grain of salt, the seven to 14 days. Um, this photo here is of a, a large SOS seed collection we made a few years ago. Um, it's I, I bet this photo was taken like peak collecting season when the room was pretty much filled with seed collections and we were a little bit um, low on space because I would say this might be a little bit piled high. Ideally, this would be a, a, a little bit thinner layer. Um, so large collections should just be turned every few days. Just make sure that there's like ventilation and airflow so that your collections can dry properly. Um, if I was to leave this pile this high and not turn it um, for 14 days, I might come back and move the collection aside and see that there's even mold growing on the newspaper that has happened before. And these um, shelves in this photo are also, you know, they were built in-house with materials we already had. We're just trying to like increase our seed drying space. Um, so these are even a little bit bulky, you know, preventing airflow. Um, so ideally you would have, you know, something that's more like wire mesh shelving um, that allows for more airflow. Um, but you can use shallow boxes for collection drying if your collections are already fairly dry. So I have a photo of that in this first uh, picture. The two collections in the front here are just being dried in shallow open boxes. Um, I say if your collections are already fairly dry, um, it's a sort of, you'll get a good feel for it the more you work with seed collections, but just imagine like shoving your hands into this collection and like squeezing the material. 
if you do that and it's still pretty um, flexible, like there's give to the to the material and it feels slightly cool to the touch, it's probably pretty pretty wet still, um, right? If you were to do that and everything's just crumbling in your hands and there's no change in temperature, it's probably pretty dry. So you can sort of assess your seed collections, you know, that's a very um, lo you know, low tech without using any equipment to measure the actual humidity of the collection, um, way to get a general sense of how dry your collection is and, you know, pay closer attention to the collections that are coming in feeling pretty humid, um, you know, spread them out in thinner layers, turn them more often. Um, so relative to humidity is actually has a greater impact on seed longevity than temperature. So it's even more important to dry your seeds properly than it is to keep them cool. Um, both are good, but it's even more important to keep them dry. Um, so this is a really wonderful graphic that I um, I screen grabbed from one of the Q Millennium Seed Bank technical information sheets. Um, I'm going to mention those technical information sheets later in my talk as well. It's just re um, really great information on these technical information sheets. So I want to make sure that um, that's provided as like additional information to learn about, um, about seed banking in general. Uh, but this graphic shows, right, so it shows the relative humidity of a seed collection um, sort of through the different developmental stages. So, right, first the seeds are being formed, then they're ripening. So the humidity of those seeds are going down as they're ripening. This is sort of the optimum time to collect. So hopefully you're collecting fully ripe seeds and not collecting immature seeds. Um, and then during this dispersal post-harvest, stage, you can see the, the relative humidity of the seeds is sort of fluctuating, and that's because uh, it's fluctuating with ambient fluctuations in relative humidity. So, um, you know, overnight when, when temperatures are low, the relative humidity is higher, and if your seed collections are, um, are getting too, or in too humid of conditions, they're not gonna be drying down. And if they're in too humid of, uh, humid of conditions, um, like between 85 and 100%, there's a really high risk of mold forming. If they're just between 50 and 85% relative humidity, um, there's a really high risk of aging. So the general rule of thumb is to keep seed collections under ambient daytime relative humidity of 50%. Um, and sort of to protect those collections from absorbing um, moisture overnight when temperatures fall. Um, so in Claremont in Southern California, we're pretty lucky in this regard in that it's almost always under 50% relative humidity. Um, even overnight, you know, it's peaking just above 50% relative humidity. Um, so we don't have to worry too much about humidity in, in Claremont. But if you were doing your seed drying in San Francisco, um, it's almost always above 50% relative humidity. So you can't really expect to dry those seed collections down, you know, in San Francisco fog um, in a, in a non-temperature uh, and humidity controlled area. So if you can't uh, dry unprocessed collections in ambient conditions. There are some options, right? You could uh, dry collections in cloth bags over um, silica desiccant in an airtight container. So that's what is being shown here. Again, these are taken from one of those Q uh, Millennium Seed Bank technical information sheets. Um, so they have silica in the bottom here, they're hanging these bags of collections, and then they can close this uh, drum so it's airtight. Um, you could also be drying collections in cloth bags in an incubator, um, so that can fit even more collections, um, also more expensive, but it can be really efficient at drying collections. Or you could, you could um, set up a dry room with a dehumidification system for drying large quantities of seeds. Um, so it sort of depends on what your situation is, what your ambient conditions are, um, how many collections you're working with, and how much money you have um, to determine sort of the best way to dry down your seeds. And then I just wanted to mention um, this here. I could have also put this at the end of processing, but I thought I'd mention it here. So for collections with major bug infestations, you can put them into an airtight container with a no pest strip for 48 to 72 hours. 
Um, so the container we use for our bug box is this um, just plastic container that's sealable. We throw a no pest strip in there, throw the seed collections in the bags in there, and we can kill pests. Um, so it's seeds of success protocol that all collectors are, are fumigating their seeds before they send them to be processed. Um, and that sort of has two purposes. One is to kill seeds or to kill uh, the pests that are eating the seeds, like the seed predators. And it's also to kill pests that might be a nuisance to humans that are going to be processing the collection. So if you're, you know, collecting grasses in an area that has chiggers and the, you know, they, the processors don't want that to be exposed to them. So they want to fumigate all collections before they're sent there. Um, but you know, this is also a fumigant, so you shouldn't keep this in an office, the bug box in an office where people are working. It is a hazard to humans, um, and I wouldn't want to process a collection that has recently been fumigated. I don't think that that's safe, right? You're, when you're seed processing, you're like getting all up in there, and it's getting in your face, and there's dust, um, so that doesn't really seem like a safe situation to me. So ideally, you would process um, you would you would uh, bug bomb your your seeds um, after you process them, um, and if you have to uh, treat them first, just make sure you wear PPE and you know protect yourself from the fumigant. Um, yeah, I guess that's what all, all I'll say about that. So that's my section on seed drying. Um, and remember, we are gonna we're gonna be able to answer questions um, at the end. So uh, if you think of any questions, go ahead and write them in the chat and Naomi will be keeping tabs on them and we'll answer any questions at the end. Um, so now moving on to seed processing. So it's important to remove as much inert material as is feasible from seed collections to maintain seed viability. So the idea here is that living, respiring seeds sort of have natural defenses against things like mold and fungus, whereas dead plant material doesn't, right? So um, if you store your seeds with all this dead plant material, that plant material can start to decompose and sort of take the seeds down with it. Um, so we try to remove as much of this excess plant material as possible. It also has the added benefit of making the collection itself quite small, right? You might return from the field with a bunch of Trader Joe's bags filled with um, seed collections. And then when you're done processing them, you just have a tiny little amount of seed, but there's actually hundreds of thousands of seeds in that collection. So it makes it really efficient for seed storage as well. Um, so this is a photo taken from um, the Center for Plant Conservation, Best Plant Conservation Practices, which is another resource I'm going to talk more about. Um, a really great resource with a lot of good information and sort of step-by-step -step instructions for a lot of uh, things in plant conservation. But um, this photo is showing, uh, right, this is a collection of San Diego thorn mint, um, what it looks like when it's first collected, right, full inflorescences put into paper bags. And so in seed processing, first we're gonna break down all that plant material, sort of break the seeds out of the fruits. Then we're gonna separate by size, right? So sieving out the larger and smaller material. Um, and then we're going to try to remove as much of that excess plant material as possible. So for my purposes at the California Seed Bank, where we're trying to keep seeds alive for hundreds of years, I'm trying to get them down to pure seed. Um, but for more short-term purposes, like for active restoration collections, this level is perfectly fine. Um, and for really large collections, it can be very time consuming to get them this extra step down. Um, and really it's important to try to process and store your collections as soon as possible. So really it might be a better practice to actually just process them to this level instead of spending the extra time um, trying to get the rest of that plant material out. So let's walk through exactly how to do that. So for seed processing, um, we start with threshing and sieving. So this is the process of removing seeds from the plant, breaking up that, that remaining plant material. So the stems and leaves and floral parts into chaff. Um, and we do that in the California Seed Bank, mainly with hand tools. Um, we were sort of established more for these 
um, sort of small focused maternal line seed collections of rare plants where we're trying to get, you know, 3,500 seeds per accession. Um, so more small focused collections. So we use a lot of hand tools, but surprisingly we have been able to keep up with our restoration size collections with the materials that we use. I'm gonna add in a couple uh, pictures of fancier equipment. There's a lot of fancy equipment out there for seed processing large quantities. Um, and so, you know, depending on your budget and capacity, might want to, you know, look into some of those, but mainly I'll be presenting what we use at CalBG. So for, um, this is this uh, wooden piece of equipment. It's a very simple piece of equipment, but it has a very fancy name. It's the D-Bearder, D-Honor. So you can put um, bulk material in here um, and sort of rub uh, the material on a, a rubber mat to break stuff up and uh, really get the collection, uh, the seeds out of the plant material. Um, so with that threshing sort of activity, you can also uh, thresh material, material directly over sieves. Um, so this is a soil sieve and we have this wooden block that has rubber on the, the bottom um, for breaking up plant material. Um, with this pro process of threshing, you just have to be careful um, not to harm your seeds um, in this process. Um, so if you if there's like mechanical damage to your seeds that can kill them, it can reduce their viability, it can reduce their longevity and storage. So usually what I'll do is I'll start with a small, uh, a small portion of seeds and process them all the way and make sure that what I'm doing is not damaging them and then uh, move forward with the full collection. And then with sieving, um, we have these nice soil sieves um, that are all different sizes. Usually we're using a sieve that the seeds go through and a sieve that they don't go through, right? So the, we catch the seeds in the middle um, so we can remove the larger particles and the smaller particles. Um, but you don't need the, the fancy screens um, if you don't have the budget for it. There's uh, cheaper options. Um, my predecessor, Michael Wall at the Seed Bank, uh, was kind of a MacGyver, and this talk is going to be sprinkled with Michael Wall inventions. Not, not necessarily inventions. Some of them are inventions, I would say. But um, Michael um, built, I think, these, these screens that you know, it's just a wooden frame with screens of different sizes and um, something for rubbing that material over the screens. Um, so you can also get by with uh, a setup kind of like that for your large bulk material. Um, but they do have fancy machines that do this kind of thing on a larger scale um, and are, are less manual. So um, this clipper machine, you can put a bunch of uh, material, uh, your, your collection up here, and then there's this sort of cylinder. And inside the cylinder, there's like a, a circular screen that's turning around. And so your plant material is going in and sort of uh, being agitated by this, this motion and it's sort of rubbing up against the screen and so you can process a lot more material in a short amount of time. Um, so this is more of like a tabletop piece of equipment that's pretty big. It's out of the, the screen, you can't really see how big my, my hands are, but it's, it's a fairly large piece of equipment and I think they have different sizes as well. And then the next step um, after threshing and sieving is winnowing, which is where you separate seeds from chaff or plant material by weight. Um, and so, and you can, it can also be used to remove immature, damaged, and unfilled seeds. Um, so the way that this works, we have uh, this one on the left. It's an Oregon seed blower. And so it's essentially like a leaf blower in a box. And you can put your material down in this cup and then, uh, blow air through this column. And so uh, you can adjust the speed of the air. And so the particles are floating up and getting caught in these cups. Um, and so for, this is really how one of the ways that you get seeds down to this level, um, because you can imagine that all of this material that's about the same size, the seeds that are, you know, filled with a juicy, healthy embryo are going to weigh more than the dead, dry plant material of the same size. Um, and then this, this is what I wish I had, which is a seed blower that is continuous feed and has a hopper. So you can put large amounts um, of collections in this hopper 
and set it up properly and sort of walk away from it and it'll blow your whole collection um, versus my seed blower. I can only fill this cup like halfway um, at most. And so I'm blowing in a bunch of small batches, um, but we get by. And again, um, you know, the, the blower really is for more thorough seed cleaning for long-term storage, um, but some collections really have a lot more chaff than others. And so it would be ideal to at least be able to remove some of it. And it would remove a lot of bulk from your collections. Some other fun things about seed processing. So uh, the photo on the left, sometimes you have to bake pine cones to get them to open and release their seed. Um, but remember, cool and dry is the theme here. So really, um, this is a, a, a weird instance where we would actually be applying heat. Otherwise, we would not want to do that. Um, and then same thing over here with fleshy fruits. There's sort of this whole other process as well. Um, so if I had fleshy fruits, I had a berry collection. So hopefully you're, you know, collecting those berries into uh, plastic and keeping them nice and cool. You could even bring like an ice chest out in the field with you, you know, bring them back, put them in a the refrigerator right away. You're going to want to process those ASAP because those are going to go moldy really fast. Um, so another Michael Wall invention. Um, this is a blender with weed whacker core duct tape to the blades. Um, so we can put uh, berries in here and water and sort of use the weed whacker to, to macerate the berries and sort of break apart the fruit pulp from the seeds. And then we would wash that over a screen to start you know, separating some of that fruit pulp. So again, cool and dry, but this is an instance where we might be adding water. Um, and so the stage after this would be then to take this material, you can see the seeds, I think this is lemonade berry, you can see the seeds um, here, and then this is all the fruit pulp. So we would take this and spread it out, dry it out, and then go through the whole process of threshing, sieving, winnowing um, once again. So fleshy fruits are just a couple extra steps for seed processing, and it needs to be prioritized for seed processing and done um, immediately to prevent mold. I wanted to share with you this um, seed processing resource. Um, so this is Processing Seeds of California Native Plants for Conservation, Storage, and Restoration by Michael Wall, so my, my predecessor at the Seed Bank, and John McDonald, who's a research associate who takes um, really great photographs. So this manual is really wonderful. So it, it has, it talks out a lot of um, seed processing techniques, a lot of things with very low tech equipment um, and, you know, includes photos. You can see what we're doing. At the bottom is a, another Michael Wall um, invention where he has a bucket with a heavy lid and he puts a weed whacker in there and that's for threshing large quantities of dry material. Um, so that's really fun. And then uh, this, uh, it also in the manual, um, it lists out all of these California native plants and, you know, descriptions of what the fruit and the seed look like, um, descriptions of how we process that collection and uh, difficulty level. And then it combines uh, John's photos of the seeds, which by the way, so John is, um, right, he's a research associate. Um, he takes all of our seed photos. So all these photos at the tops of my slides are John's photos. Um, and seeds are just so interesting and diverse and beautiful, and you should like them. Um, but also it's just a great resource to be able to see what the seeds of these different plants are supposed to look like. Um, so John posts all of these photos on his website. It's also linked through the CalBG website. And you can, you know, scroll through and, and pick a photo and see sometimes he combines the photos of the seeds with photos of fruits or plants or germination tests. And it can just be a really great resource when you're working with seeds. Um, okay, so moving on to seed storage. So now we have dried our seeds, we've processed them down as much as we can um, with the time that we have. <laughs> and so now moving on to how to store those seeds. So there's a couple options here for long-term storage. Um, this has the goal of keeping seeds alive for potentially hundreds of years in these freezers. Many, many seeds, if they're processed and stored correctly, are quite long-lived. Um, so it's a really cost-effective means of ex situ plant conservation. Um, so the, the seed bank that I manage, we just use home-grade chest freezers. They're, they're nothing fancy. They aren't scientific-grade freezers. 
Um, if you are going to store in these chest freezers, make sure um, chest freezers are better than uprights just because when you, uh, if you're going to be, you know, digging into the collection frequently, when you open up a, a, a chest freezer or an upright freezer, you know, a lot of the temperature, all of the cold air will just fall right out. So there'll be more fluctuations in the, the temperature versus a chest freezer where you'll open it from the top. And so the cool air is sort of staying down there. Um, also, uh, manual defrost is better than automatic defrost. So there will be ice buildup in your freezers. Um, but the way automatic defrost freezers work is that their sides warm up periodically. So ice can't form and we want low and constant humidity and temperature. So the, the sides heating up is an issue for long-term seed storage. But anyway, so we, we can keep seeds alive in storage for a long time like this. And it is if you're processing your, your seed collections down, you can store a lot of seeds in a small amount of space. Um, so again, we are uh, primarily um, storing smaller um, maternal lion seed collections for our rare plants, but we have um, seven chest freezers and over 5,000 accessions and we're not even close to being full. So you, you can store quite a bit of material like this. Um, but in order to store, in the freezers, you have to dry your seeds properly. So this is separate, but similar drying to what we talked about earlier when you're just trying to dry the material after collection. You actually have to dry seeds, ideally to 35% relative humidity at room temperature. So if you're doing your drying at room temperature, which we are, um, we try to get the seeds to about 35% relative humidity so we can store them in the freezers. Um, Relative humidity is relative to the temperature, so that actually means if I'm if I'm drying at room temperature and then I put those seeds into the freezers, the humidity of the collection is actually closer to 20% relative humidity, and that's sort of the ideal range. So how do we do that? We have these seed drying chambers. Again, um, Michael Wall's uh, ingenuity, he has some... Uh, some terrariums with some silicone adhesive on top and a piece of glass, so they are sealed. And then we have perforated canisters um, containing silica, so we can keep these chambers nice and dry um, and monitor the humidity inside the chambers and the silica will absorb the moisture from the seeds. And then we have this hygrothermometer where we can take a sample of seeds put it in this chamber with the sensor on top and get a reading of the humidity of the actual seed collection to make sure it's in the correct range for storage. How we store our collections, so um, you need to, if you're storing in a refrigerator, in a, in a freezer, you have to have humidity control. You can't let the humidity be um, fluctuating. So we store in sealed containers. So for our common seed collections, we're storing in these um, square polyethylene bottles that have sort of a double cap. There's like a plug you put in and then you can screw on the, the lid. Um, and for our rare seed collections, we store in these heat sealed foil packets. Um, so that's a little bit more sealed than the bottles, but it's also harder to get into, um, right? So in order to access the collection, you have to cut into the bag. Um, so that's why we sort of store them separately and a little bit differently. Um, but you don't have to do um, long-term storage for your seeds. You can actually keep seeds of many taxa alive for 10 plus years, just in like a walk-in refrigerator or climate controlled warehouse sort of situation. And that's what a lot of, you know, more restoration programs are doing. Um, uh, so it's good for larger active collections. Um, and, but again, seeds need to be at a stable, ideal humidity for this type of storage. Um, so I'm saying here storage at five degrees Celsius, which is like a, a standard refrigerator um, temperature, but the humidity in a standard refrigerator is pretty high. So you still need to be drying your collections and make sure that they are maintained at the ideal humidity so you can keep them alive for those 10 years. Um, and I keep talking about the, the humidity ranges and how they compare depending on the temperature. So here's a chart from the CPC best plant conservation practices that sort of shows, okay, if you're drying your collections for long-term storage at negative 20 degrees um, and you're drying your seeds at room temperature, you should try to do 35% uh, humidity. And if you are 
um, storing them at five degrees Celsius for medium term. Um, you can do 33% humidity. Um, so the, the temperature that you're drying your seeds at changes the humidity that you're targeting and the storage temperature changes the humidity. So just look at this and, and, and you know, draw your own uh, conclusions of how dry you want your seeds for um, what your situation is, how, how uh, cold you're storing your seeds and how, what the temperature is that you're doing your drying at. For storage in medium term, um, so if you're drying your seeds to the right humidity and you're just storing them in a refrigerator that doesn't have humidity control, you should store them in some sort of sealable container. Um, so I'm showing a picture of my plastic polyethylene bottles that I use at the California Seed Bank, but you can use, you know, glass mason jars or, you know, a variety of different kinds of packaging, um, those Q bags, you know, heat sealed bags if you want. Um, but something has to be totally sealed so you can maintain that low humidity. Um, but if you have, if you are storing your seeds in a place that does have humidity control, so if it's a, um, a, a storage room that was designed to have controlled humidity and temperature, um, then you can just store in grain bags, which are really great for large bulk material and also um, pretty easy to access, you know, pull it open, pull some seeds out. Um, so there are some options depending on your situation. Um, before you store your seeds, you're going to want to get a seed quantity estimate. So you do not have to count all of your seeds. So that's good. Um, the way that we get an estimate for our seed collections is by taking a portion of those seeds um, and weighing them and then weighing the total so that you can just sort of solve for the number of seeds. So if I took out 200 seeds and weighed them and then got the total weight, I could figure out how many seeds roughly I have. Um, just if you're doing this, make sure in your 200 weight, you're including the same proportion of chaff in the collection. So if I was to only pull out pure seed, but the rest of my collection has chaff in it, I'm going to be overestimating the number of seeds I have because I'm making the assumption that all of the weight that I have is seed weight, which isn't true. And then just a little bit about splitting collections for storage. Um, so consider whether you want to split portions of seeds for different purposes. That's easier to do sort of ahead of time than it is to do later. Um, so if you want to split collections for safety, safety duplication, if you want to have some for long-term storage and some for medium, if you need some seeds for seed amplification um, or other immediate use. So this is an example that was taken from the Seeds of Success um, technical protocol, which is also you know, available online as a PDF. You can view it, it has a lot of great information and information about um, how the Bureau of Land Management um, sort of manages their restoration seed banking program. Um, but this is a table that shows, so for collections with, you know, between this many seeds, they are splitting two thirds of them out um, for long-term storage and, uh, with one third going to NLGRP, um, one third going to this other location, and then they're keeping a third of it in medium term storage as a working collection. For collections that are larger than that, just the first 10,000 seeds are partitioned like that, and the remaining balance is available for native plant materials development projects. Um, so how you split out your seeds is going to depend on your own programming and your own goals for your collection. Um, so for example, at CalBG for our long-term storage of our rare seed collections, we split out a portion of our seeds to sort store separately and use for things like um, seed requests. If a researcher is studying that, that taxon and wants a sample of seeds for their research, you know, we can pull that out of the freezers. We have to defrost it and remove seeds. So we wouldn't necessarily be wanting to defrost and refreeze the entire collection that often that can be damaging to the seeds. Um, so we split out what we call um, an active or a curation package. Um, and we can also use that for doing follow-up germination testing. So we don't have to defrost the entire collection. Okay, and that sort of, sort of launches us into seed viability. So it's really important to get some sort of baseline of seed viability for your collections, um, because there can be a really big range of seed viability, even within the same species collected from the same site in different years, there might be large differences in the amount of viable seed actually present in that collection. Um, so one really sort of easy 
way to get an assessment of seed health is to do cut tests. Um, we actually recommend that people do these in the field before you even make a collection as well. And it's to take a sample of seeds, cut them open and take note of what the embryos look like. So a healthy seed should have an embryo that pretty much fills the seed coat. It should be whitish in color and it should be moist. So if you cut open your seed and it looks like this with a you know dried shriveled embryo or it's empty, that seed isn't viable. And it's pretty common for plant populations to produce you know, high portions of unfilled seeds or sometimes no filled seeds at all. So that's why we want people doing these cut tests before they even make a collection because you, know, you could put a lot of man hours into making a collection, bring it back and realize there's no viable seed in it. So let's avoid that. Um, but also after you do your seed processing, it's a good practice to take some sample of seeds, um, whether it's 10 seeds or 50 seeds, whatever, and cut them open and take note of, you know, how many look healthy um, to keep on record for that collection. But that doesn't tell the whole story, right? So a seed, a seed can look like this, it can look healthy, but it can still, you know, not be alive, not be viable, not have the ability to germinate. Um, and so we also do germination tests at CalBG. Um, so that's where we just take a sample of our seeds and plate them. We, we plate our seeds on agar, some other places uh, use blotter paper or paper towels. Um, we've had the most success with agar and we'll see what proportion of the seeds germinate. Um, so why do we conduct these tests first, right? To assess initial seed viability, making sure we're actually storing uh, living seed. Um, second is to monitor seed viability through the storage term. So we actually do tests after one year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, and every subsequent 10 years in storage. Um, so we can make sure the seeds are staying alive. And also because not all seeds can be stored by these methods. Um, so there's some portion of seeds in the world that we call recalcitrant. They actually can't withstand the drying process. Um, so they can't be frozen, they can't be stored by conventional storage methods. Um, the seeds usually just live one year. So um, things like oaks and walnuts and um, buckeyes and jojoba, you know, in California are examples of recalcitrant species. Usually it's seeds that are sort of larger and, and fattier. So it actually has to do with the lipid content of the seeds that makes them recalcitrant. Um, and so if you have restoration needs for species that are recalcitrant, um, you're not going to want to try to seed bank them at all. You're going to want to collect and immediately propagate them for, for use. Um, and then there's what we call intermediate species. These might live, you know, they can be dried and they, they can be frozen, but they might only live, you know, five to 10 years in storage or less. And that's really not very long. And um, so, there's some recalcitrant or intermediate species like Salix that uh, for seeds of success, they don't have that as one of their targets because it wouldn't really make sense to put all the effort into collecting, processing, storing um, when the seeds are only gonna live five years. Um, so that's just something to sort of keep in mind when you're making your target list, make sure you're targeting seeds for seed banking that can actually be seed banked. Um, but unfortunately there's no, like comprehensive list of all the recalcitrant and intermediate species of the world. This is still information that we're learning. Um, and so at CalBG, you know, we're doing all of these follow-up germination tests so we can try to learn uh, the lifespan of these different California native plants. Um, and so if we, you know, see a, a, a certain taxon that is uh, consistently losing viability after five years in storage, we might need to explore other means of ex situ conservation for that species because it might be intermediate. And then the last reason we conduct germination tests, which is also really important, is for experimenting with pretreatments for breaking seed dormancy. So seeds are kind of amazing. Um, they're magical, Naomi said. Um, seeds, wild seeds tend to have um, uh, pretty decent levels of dormancy, which is a great adaptation to have, right? It allows them to just sit dormant in the soil seed bank and wait for the right conditions to germinate, right? So it prevents germination during unsuitable conditions when the probability of seedling survival would be low. So there's a couple different types of dormancy. 
I'm kind of going to go through this pretty quickly. I, I could give a whole talk just about C dormancy, but um, some types of C dormancy, right? So there's physical dormancy, which is just having like a really thick seed coat. You could imagine um, plants in the wild that grow in sandy environments that have seeds that are going to be rolling around on sandy surfaces. Um, and it would be beneficial to have a thick seed coat so they can survive that until the next rains come without their embryos being damaged. Or like seeds that occur in berries that are eaten by an animal might benefit from having a really thick seed coat um, so they can pass through the body of an animal and still germinate. Physiological dormancy is like the seeds need to experience some trigger from the environment. So it will like alter the chemical pathways in the seed and the seed will produce a growth hormone and germinate. But that trigger can vary depending on where the plant is growing and what it experiences. So um, some plants that grow in you know cold environments where there's a cold winter, sometimes they develop a dormancy mechanism where they required a cold period followed by a warming event and that's what triggers germination. Um, uh, many plants in California can be adapted to fire. One of the ways they can be adapted by, to fire is actually the seeds require some trigger from the environment that a fire has gone through and that triggers germination so that after fire, um, there could be a, this, this new flush of growth um, and the landscape can start to heal. And then there's morphological dormancy, which is that the, you know, the seeds are ripe and they fall off the plant, but they're just still not ready. So they just need time. So maybe they have underdeveloped embryos or um, like the, the cells still need to differentiate and they just need time. So maybe they'll just sit in the soil seed bank for a year before they're ready to germinate. And then there can be like combinations of multiple, there can physical and physiological or physiological and morphological. Um, so dormancy can be pretty complicated. It can be complicated to figure out. And so what that means for trying to grow plants outside of their native habitat is that you often have to trick them into experiencing what they might experience in the wild um, so they can break dormancy and germinate. So for example, for physical dormancy, we can use sandpaper to break down seed coats. We can clip through seed coats or soak them in boiling water or acid. For physiological dormancy, that thing I said about, you know, some plants requiring, like coming in contact with fire, some trigger from fire. Uh, one of the ways they can be triggered by fire is that they actually need to come into contact with the molecules found in smoke. Um, and you know what else has the molecules in smoke is liquid smoke. So we can trick them into thinking a fire has gone through by soaking them in diluted liquid smoke. Um, or sometimes we literally have to burn plant material over, over seeds. Sometimes we have to do combinations of multiple of these. And so I, I mention all of this just because this is a really Im important sort of key in the, the pipeline, right? If you're collecting all the seeds, you're gonna wanna be able to use it. So you're gonna need to know how to grow those plants from seed. Um, so germination testing, you know, helps figure out how to grow plants from seed. Um, and there's some things that are really hard to grow from seed. And so there's just, you know, restoration with those species is just from vegetative cutting. So it's seed is not collected. Um, and so we need to, you know, develop protocol to figure out how to grow those things from seed or else we might not want to invest too much energy into making large seed collections of something we don't know how to use. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to mention, um, again, some of these additional resources. Um, the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership has these technical info sheets that are really great. There's a bunch of them on this website. Um, there's some for seed collecting, some for post-harvest handling of collections. There's even one for like how to build a dry room, how to build a you know storage room. Um, I like studied these when I first became seed bank manager. Um, so I, I think very highly of them. There's also the Center for Plant Conservation has these uh, best plant conservation practices. Um, this is available on their website as a, a PDF download. Um, there's a lot of other great information on the CPC website. They have um, the Rare Plant Academy where you can even watch videos from practitioners that show you how to do what they're doing in their, in their seed banks. Um, and that is just uh, a really, really great resource as well. And then there's this International Network uh, for Seed-Based Restoration has these native seed uh, video series coming out right now. And I've watched a couple of them. So it's a nine part video series 
all about, you know, supplying seeds for restoration in the Western U.S. And they're very beautiful, like they're really well produced. They're fun, short watches, each of these little videos, um, but they're also informational. And uh, it's all, so they're coming out every Thursday through the summer. Um, so there's going to be one on cleaning and storage on August 3rd. And then um, it's all going to end with the full length uh, 60 minute documentary version. Um, so I recommend y'all watch that because they, they're they also, you know, they're informational, but they're also just beautiful and interesting. It's a really good watch. Um, so yeah, that is all I have for us today. Um, so now I think we can move on to take questions. Thank you, Cheryl. Very um, informational session here. Uh, we have some really good questions that came in through the Q&A. Um, just to start off, uh, there's a question about um, the ability to use a food dehydrator set to the lowest temperature for drying seeds. Um, and she also mentions, Mary mentions that the lowest uh, temperature she has is 95 degrees Fahrenheit. What do you think about that? No, that's way too hot. Yeah, 95 degrees is not good. You actually want to try to keep your seeds below room temperature or below. So you don't really want to keep them above 25 degrees Celsius. So what is that? 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so I would not use a food dehydrator or in, be introducing heat for seed drying purposes. Okay. Um, Angel asks um, about growing native plants in urban habitats. Um, I think you and I can both answer this. Um, do seeds from these plants and populations also get collected? Um, and is there research related to the genetics of urban populations? Um, maybe you can talk about seed LA again a little bit, and then I can take the second part about the genetics of urban populations. That sounds good. Yeah, so, um, so that's a, a really good topic. Um, there, is very much a need to collect seed from urban environments. And so we, we have, um, together with other institutions in the Los Angeles area, formed a, a collaborative seed banking group called Seed LA, where we're trying to collect from these like remnant populations in urban LA, um, trying to really carefully, without over, overly impacting these already highly impacted populations, build up seed resources so that we can be using local native seed in habitat enhancement projects. And so we're trying to avoid needing to use bought-in seed or non-native seed for these projects and really sort of use those habitat enhancement projects as an opportunity to conserve local biodiversity. Um, so that is um, really important to, to conserve that diversity. You know, these plants that are growing in, in the urban core and compacted soils with pollution and they're surviving and they're thriving, it's really important to sort of, you know, tap into that genetic diversity and conserve that genetic diversity because those are the plants that are able to survive in urban LA. Um, so yes, that's my answer. <laughs> Great. Um, and then regarding the genetics of urban, popula uh, urban populations, there's actually a project happening right now with a woman named Sanapa Patella. Um, she's looking at California buckwheat and comparing urban and populations with populations that are in more intact habitat to see if urban populations are better adapted to um, growing in the urban environment are better and are better seed floors for urban restoration projects. So she's done a combination of a common garden study and she's actually partnering with us here at the garden to do um, a population genetic study of the California buckwheat sampling both urban and um, populations from more intact habitat across the California buckwheat, which includes multiple varieties of that species. So stay tuned for those results. Um, there is a question about um, um, how do you process seeds or chaff and seeds are the same shape, weight, and size? Mm. Yes, same shape, weight, and size. Okay, so I, I thought about mentioning this and I probably should have. So one, one, other, one other difference between the seeds and the plant material that you could take advantage of is their, sh like their shape or their texture. So sometimes like the seeds are a little bit more round than the plant material, or maybe they're smoother. So sometimes I can just take them on like 
some sort of slightly textured surface like um, blotter paper or a paper plate, or we had felt at some point, but I, I didn't wind up, wind up using that. And you can kind of shake them and maybe the seeds will sort of fall out. And there are um, really fancy machines that take advantage of those differences and do it automatically as well. Um, but I use a lot of paper plate shaking in the seed bank for processing collections like that. Eight. Okay, there's a couple of questions about the hygrometer, mm -hmm. about the the thermometer for measuring seed humidity. The mm -hmm. hygrometer. And then um, someone wants to know um, where do you where you put the small amount of seed for the sample. Just explain more about like use of the hygrometer and how that works. Yeah, so it's a it's a hygrothermometer. Ours is from Rotronic. Um, it's it is a little bit expensive. I can't remember the exact cost, but we had to uh, fundraise for it. And uh, so you you just take it's there's this little cup, and you put the seeds in the sensor. Like you put the seeds in the chamber and put the sensor on top. And it usually takes like five minutes to get a reading because you have to wait for the seeds to reach equilibrium with the air. Um, and then it just pops out a number for you and that's your relative humidity of your flexion. Great. Katie asks if there's a good database or resource for looking up seed viability for different California species. Oh, good question. I have this in other talks, but I didn't have time to put it in today. So um, you can actually access all of our raw a sample, a, a, a summary of all of our raw germination data on our website. So if you go to the seed conservation page, there's a place to, to click um, germination data and it'll let you download an Excel document that has all of our, it's just a, a summary, like a one line per, per um, test, how many seeds were tested, how many germinated, what was the pre-treatment, start date, end date, stuff like that. Um, so there's a lot more information in our database that's not just in this Excel document. So, um, but it, it it's really handy. You can like scroll through and look at all the tests we've ever done on this one species. The only thing is you kind of have to uh, take the information with a grain of salt, knowing that we are testing multiple things at once. So if something didn't germinate, you know, looking at it and saying, okay, well, was the seed just not viable to begin with? Or is this a follow-up test and they're dying in storage? Or was that just not the right pre-treatment? Um, anyway, so you can always email me with any questions about our germination data. You can also, um, there's like a, a the Dara Emery book that's Seed Germination of California Native Plants that was put out by Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. That's a good resource for looking at um, pretreatments for breaking dormancy of many California native plants. Uh, it was published in the 80s, though, and there, there's no update to the data. So a lot has been learned since the 80s. Um, and then um, like the California Native Plant Society uh, CalScape um, website sometimes has information for like seed production. Um, how, uh, there's a lot of really handy information on CalScape about uh, different California native plants and where they grow and what conditions they require and stuff like that. And sometimes there's information in there about seed germination. So when I'm trying to figure out how to germinate something, I'll usually start by looking at our data and seeing, have we tested this before? Have we tested something related? I can you know, look at these other resources. And then sometimes I'm just looking at where the plant grows and what it might experience in the wild and taking a, an educated guess and seeing what happens. Great, thank you. Um, there was a question in the chat from Nita and she was curious more about the seed fumigation. She also has concerns about using the seed fumigation. She asked, do you typically off gas the seeds? If so, for how long? Um, Cause she's noticed that the fumigation strips have a lingering scent. Yeah, that's what I noticed too. So I, I think I've only ever fumigated seeds. I have processed maybe t once or twice. And that's what I was noticing when I was processing them is I could, it's almost like I could taste the fumigant on my mouth. I'm like, oh, wow, this is not safe. So I, I just don't have that part as part of my protocol. I will prioritize seed processing, but again, we're not really working in an area where like our collections, 
the collections we're making, we don't really have an issue with pests that are detrimental to humans. So that's where there's sort of a lack in my knowledge about this topic. Um, it, I think it could be really beneficial to talk to Bend more. I, I emailed them once about it, asking like, oh, are you worried about the fumigant and how do you handle it? And they kind of just sent me an, a message saying like, oh yeah, it's not really a problem, but it might be that they're, they have more of a backlog. So their seeds are sitting after being fumigated, they're sitting for longer. And so maybe they can um, sort of off gas and maybe it's not as, as bad. I'm, I'm not really sure about that. So I usually prioritize processing the collections and then fumigate them if there's still a bug problem with like seed predators. Um, and then there's a question about temperature for short-term storage. What is the highest temperature it for that you recommend for like a short-term storage room? Um, I mean, yeah, if you look across like all of these resources I have shared today, there there definitely is a bit of a range. Um, a lot of places essentially say like below 10 degrees Celsius, I think would be a safe bet. Um, but a, a lot of places say like four to five degrees Celsius. Um, someone is asking about backup of the freezers. Can you please uh, discuss the, the, the backup system we have at California Botanic Garden and what might be recommended for power security? Yes, power security is very important. Um, so at CalVG, we have a, we have a solar power that feeds a, a lithium ion battery and we never let it, the battery get too low so it can serve as battery backup for us. And in that sense, I mean, we're also, we're in Southern California where we have a lot of sunlight. Um, so on our system, we theoretically should be able to survive off grid um, just with our solar and our battery. But then if there's, you have to account for, okay, well, what if there's a system failure, right? What if the inverters are down? Um, we also have a generator that's dual fuel. So it, it will run off of natural gas. Um, and then in, if natural gas is out, like if it was a large seismic emergency and natural gas was down for an extended period of time, we have a bunch of propane on site and it sort of automatically switches to propane. So we've built a lot of layers of security into our system because uh, we're storing so many rare seed collections, um, but we also, we send uh, backup samples of all of our rare seed collections to another facility, even as additional backup. Um, and then maybe it's worth noting that, you know, at some point we did uh, look into whether it would be beneficial for us to have like a walk-in freezer, um, but with a walk-in freezer, it's sort of like an all, all your eggs in one basket sort of situation. So if we had equipment failure on the walk-in freezer, all of our seeds would start to defrost versus if I have equipment failure on one of my seven freezers, I could move all of the collections to another freezer while I'm getting that equipment repaired. Um, or we could we could pretty easily evacuate the entire collection by, you can unplug a freezer, load it on a flatbed and drive away. And as long as you're keeping it closed, um, you know, within eight hours, your your seeds are gonna remain frozen. There's a lot of, we, yeah, we have, we work a lot of um, emergency power security into our system because that's really honestly very important, keeping your seeds frozen. And we, for some reason, have a lot of power issues at the garden. So we had to um, invest quite a bit in power security for the collections. Um, there is a question about um, if you have any other information about other kinds of desiccators to use, um, asking about recommended desiccators, including vacuum desiccators rather than anhydrous silica. Yeah, I, you know, I know that there are other options and I don't really know very much about them because there's something that NLGRP does with using salts that I'm not familiar with. And I know that there are other ways of drying, see other kinds of desiccators. And I, I really, I really can't answer that because I don't know very much about it. I pretty much only know about silica, you know, silica drying because that's what we use and what a lot of our partners use. Um. Do you have any recommendations on storing seeds in the one to 30 pound range? Um, they're using um, six mil Ziploc bags to store seeds in a walk-in cooler. Mm. The cooler unfortunately fluctuates in temperature from mm. 24 
25 degrees Fahrenheit and is humid enough that sometimes there is condensation on the walls and the floor. Yes. Okay, so you're storing in Ziploc bags. I worry about, you know, storing in Ziploc bags because, you know, you can get a, like a puncture in them. They're not exactly fully sealed. Um, you don't have to worry very much about the humidity in your storage area as long as you're using really sealed, very sealed containers. So I wonder if you could just explore other containers to put your, that are airtight. Air, just, yeah, focusing on, on getting your collections into more airtight containers would be good. Um, uh, pound to, you said like 30 pounds. I don't, off the top of my head, don't know. I can't give a suggestion for how to, um, like an airtight container of that size to recommend because I don't think I've ever worked with a collection that large. Um, but I'm sure there's something out there or um, maybe other, like maybe within the SO, the Seeds of Success network or these other networks for restoration size collections, maybe there's recommendations out there that we can find. Um, Diana asks about how long you usually leave your seeds in the germination trials for. Oh, yeah. Sometimes uh, uh, it varies a lot. So they used to try to have it be like a set amount of time so that they're easily comparable, but seeds, some seeds just take a, a long time to germinate and some are very, very fast. So I have some collections where my germination test is over in four days and some where I let the test run for a year. Usually I let them run and the decision to end the test is based on how the seeds look in the agar, like the, the so, right? Like I said, how, um, living seeds sort of have natural defenses against things like mold and fungus, but dead plant material doesn't. And so if you're leaving your seeds for months on agar in these like nice mild conditions in a growth chamber, um, and after months, they still look good, they still look healthy, and they're not just like totally overcome with mold and mushy, they're probably alive, they're just dormant. So I'll just keep the test going and like try other treatments. Um, Versus, yeah, if they are, are decomposing on agar and like all the seeds are just totally mushy, probably those seeds were dead. So it's more now it's it's more based on uh, the quality of the seeds throughout the germination test that determines when I end the test. And then just to note for anyone who's missing it, there's there's been a lot of chatter in the chat regarding you know various pesticides and whatnot. Um, but just note that Katie Vincent says for NPS folks on the call, we're not able to use no pest strips due to health hazards. So you could contact Katie for more info or alternatives. Okay. Um, and then um, there is a question about resources for learning more about species that are good for restoration in various areas in California, specifically in areas prone to fire. Mm. I could maybe take a stab at that. And I would say, I mean, the species, the target species list for restoration can, are very, very site specific. And oftentimes have, it depends on the goal for your restoration. So for instance, we um, in our seeds of success um, target list, we are focusing on the Mojave Desert, Desert ecoregion. And um, so we have species specific to the ecoregion and even species specific to provisional seed zones. And it might be species that are important for tortoise forage, species that are important for, you know, establishing cover after wildfire or soil stabilization. So it really depends on what you're looking for and the area and what you know, you want species that are local to that region. And um, so I would say that there's no comprehensive resource, I don't think, about like workhorse species across California, but you really need to be familiar with the regional flora to develop your local lists. Um, I think those are, oh, there's a question about do you ever use a wet fermentation process for any seeds from fleshy fruits? No, I don't know what that is. Yeah, I'm not sure that we want fermentation to be taking place around the seeds. Not for seeds, not for seeds that we're like trying to store, but maybe are they saying that that's like a method for breaking dormancy? That could be, that sounds interesting. Oh. 
Angel says tomatoes and watermelons get fermented for storage. Oh, get fermented for storage. That's very strange. That's not counterintuitive to me. <laughs> um, I think those are all the questions that we have, unless anyone has any additional questions and we're almost up for time anyway, but um, yeah, great um, Q&A. Um, I will um, type Cheryl's email or in the chat, but I think you can also just look us up at uh, the California Botanic Garden. We're very easily findable. Um, and I'm also very easily findable. <laughs> um, so feel free to reach out and um, we will answer questions as best we can. But thank you everybody for attending this webinar. And um, like I said, it's been recorded and it'll be uploaded within the next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Oh, no, we don't know. I think it's going to be saved on Lauren's computer, so. Okay. Nice comments. We had 97 people, I think, at the highest viewing, and I'm sure many more people will watch the recorded version. I saw 99 at one point. Thanks everybody. I know no, I know quite a few of them are actually there are multiple people behind those screens too. So oh cool. Yeah, that's a good point. Oh, there's lots in the chat. This is my first time looking at the chat. Yeah, there was a lot of chat chatting. Chat chatting. Does the chat get saved for this? It gets downloaded. Like um, when she gets the recording, then the chat gets downloaded. With okay. Recording. Just in case there's anything in here that we missed or. I tried to go through the chat and I pulled out questions out of the chat. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, I will see you later. Bye. Okay, bye. Yeah, thanks you both. Appreciate it. Bye.